Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Best Darn Diddly Review Show. This is a weekly podcast for anyone who loves The Simpsons, or ever has loved The Simpsons, hosted by two dudes that grew up on The Simpsons. My name is Miles, better known as Mr. Most Days Off, and today, if I'm being honest with you, it's been a long time since I've done that intro, because we have been avoiding The Simpsons like crazy, trying to stretch our calendar to make a very cool thing happen, and we are on that path, but today, we are back on our mission, as we set out to begin with, to go through each and every episode of The Simpsons. Today, we cover Season 11's Grift of the Magi, and of course, joining me as always, your co-host with the most, Richie the Whiz Kid. I'm, uh, you're not gonna ask me how I'm doing today? Man, I don't even know where to go from here now. Like, I'm sorry, man, it's been a while. How you doing today, Rich? <laughs> I feel like it's a flip-flop from the last time we recorded. The last time we recorded was, like, right when I woke up, and, like, this time is, like, right in my wheelhouse when I'm usually at work, right in the middle and the thick of things. So I, I, I'm good now, man. I'm good. But, uh, this is the most chipper you've ever sounded on a podcast. <laughs> and that's with my <laughs> voice like, failing me right now, too. Um, but, yeah, it's, there's... There's a lot to like remember about this episode because I thought I, I thought this was the Funzo episode, but like halfway through it, I was like, "Is this the Funzo episode?" I thought that yeah. happened like right at the beginning, but I, I know we're gonna get into all that. This one is a uh, maybe a little earlier in the Simpsons history than I remember it as well. But I guess I need to throw it back to the guy getting us going here. The man, the myth. He's Doctor Stupid in his spare time. In his miles. <laughs> Dude, I love that line so much. It's, <laughs> that's honestly that I will say is a Ralph Wiggum line that I never think of, but it absolutely should be included in like the list of hilarious Ralph Wiggum lines because that's funny. Think- I think even more hilarious is Burns' response, but we'll get there eventually. Yeah, we'll go through it. Uh, You know, honestly, since you did talk about so many things that I also felt, though, during this episode, uh, you touched on many things, including, yes, I thought this was the Funzo episode, but I also remember the Funzo being a much larger part of the episode, and maybe it comes back. Maybe this is like a return of the Funzo, and we're just not thinking of it. Uh, because I think I, they do some stuff where it's like in the background or getting destroyed again in other episodes, but like I, it's just I thought the part where they're like going over what children like lasted a lot longer. And same, I also didn't. thought Christmas was a way bigger part of this episode. Like, yeah, I, yeah, I thought like it was like uh, almost in the spirit of uh, uh, Marge disappointed, uh, or you know, any of the other ones Marge that's like very Christmas, and... yeah, Marge be not pr- proud. Thank you. I, I knew I fucked it up, I just couldn't figure out why. Uh, yeah, but, uh, any of those Christmas episodes, I feel like I felt like this Funzo episode would have been included in that list. And after watching it, I'm like, oh well, I guess Christmas was technically there. I didn't even realize it was Christmas unless it was in the uh, like synopsis of the episode. And then like when it actually said Christmas Eve, six p.m., I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about that part. Yeah, uh, you said something else too. Um, I. Yeah, I guess we'll get there. There's another thing I felt about this episode that it was just like, yeah, that was odd. Uh, just I, I guess just like the way that my memory has deceived me on what this episode was going to be. Uh, and it was still a good episode, but it was just not the episode that I remembered it being. I think the last thing I said was that it's a lot earlier in the Simpsons history than I remember. Yes, it. I thought this was season 14 easy. Like, I, yeah, I thought yeah. this would have been like somewhere in those mid-teens. And it's like 11? Really? Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, we're going to fuck with it now then. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with the title. It's Grift of the Magi, which originally aired on December 19th, 1999. Uh, the it's Grift tough. of the Magi is a reference to the O'Henry story, The Gift of the Magi, which is a very popular, uh, usually told around Christmas time, uh, story about like the meaning of gift giving uh, in which a woman cuts off her hair to buy a man a pocket watch, her husband a pocket watch, and that husband bought... Uh, I'm sorry, that husband sold his pocket watch chain. I think I flipped those. But basically, they sold something they needed for the other gift to make sense. And it's like this whole lesson on the beauty of gift giving and like sacrifice Aww. and things like that. Uh, they did note, though, that like this is like the second or third episode to feature grifting in this season. So they were in a weird headspace, <laughs> I guess. That's why community would follow suit one day. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they, they all took the class, right? Uh, they also had the chalk gag on this one, which is, I will not sell my kidney on eBay, which is another form of grifting. Uh, and then the couch gag where they all come down the fireman's pole into the living room. And then Homer, of course, gets stuck. 
Yeah, and they even animated like the parts of him that were stuck on the pole, where like it made him look like he was completely encompassing it. It's these little tiny lines, but it added so much to the moment. There's definitely some animation stuff in this episode that's really funny. Uh, Burton's moment in particular that is, in my opinion, the correct amount of absurd. Uh, <laughs> but we'll we'll talk about that. I'm confident. I will go ahead and mention real quick the commentary for this episode featured Tom Martin, Tim Long, George Meyer, Mike Scully, Matt Selman, Ian Maxton Graham, Lance Kramer, and Matt Groening. And I'll also say that the list of names I just read for the commentary is going to be longer than the amount of things I have to say from the commentary. Uh, there's not a huge amount, but one of them is uh, the this was first the first uh, like full scripted episode for Tim Long or credited episode for Tim Long, and uh, he got the idea from reading an article about a like school that was allowing businesses to sponsor their school to the point that they were even putting ads in textbooks. Uh, and then, of course, that combined with the toy craze that was happening every year, probably most popular, the Tickle Me Elmo. But there was always something at Christmas that like was driving people like crazy, and he kind of merged those ideas together to come up with a script. Uh, calm yourself, Miles. Tickle me, Elmo. Can't hold a candle to Turbo Man. Okay. I also looked up that movie because of the obvious comparisons, <laughs> and that one came out in 1996. So <clears throat> it, it's it's a concept that you know we can't say that Simpsons did it by any means. It's I don't think they necessarily copied it just because it's such a common trope of what like uh, capitalist culture in the 90s was or or yeah. today. Just like Love Day. Honestly, yeah, it's the same joke, just in a different format. Mm -hmm. This episode opens up with Bart and Lisa, as they so often are, watching TV. It's the Kent Brockman talking about the hole in the ozone layer that's moved from Brazil to Springfield for the winter. Uh, and they look outside to actually see like it's literally chasing Millhouse. I also love the joke as they're, they're talking about the level of uh, sunscreen that you need to wear. It's uh, recommended on the amount of hair people have on the scale from Robin Williams uh, all the way down to, I don't even know what it said for the other other end of the scale, but Robin Williams was a nine because they he did. was a hair They said experts recommend a class nine or Robin Williams level of hair coverage if you don't have sunscreen. There it is. Yeah. Uh, but that's when you see Milhouse. It's like almost like Milhouse is the ant and he's running from like the magnifying glass beam. Uh, but it's literally the ozone layer, uh, and it's like a get-follow situation as he's banging on the door trying to get in before the light can get him. Yeah, at least uh, Lisa of all will let him in. I mean, she knows that he's annoying, but she still lets him in. But then uh, is this, this where they put something on Lisa's face and call her Millhouse? It's silly string, right? No, they're well, that, looking through the closet. Silly. It's the next scene. Yeah, they're inside. They're looking through the closet trying to find something. I love the line when Millhouse is all like, oh, man, I can't wait till we're teenagers. Then we'll be happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're so naive. Uh, they then, find some – oh, go ahead. I was going to say, and then that's when, when Lisa's looking through the closet, and she's like, they can play Clam Traffic Jam or mm -hmm. the game of County Seats. Oh, the zoning disc is warped. <laughs> uh, Bart, that's when Bart, Bart finds the silly string. Yeah, and he spray paints or silly string paints glasses and eyebrows that are all blue on Lisa. <laughs> Look, you're a Millhouse. Who wets their bed now, Millhouse? <laughs> <laughs> and that's Millhouse roasting himself. Lisa decides she's done with this and goes to her room. Uh, and that's when Milhouse and Bart, who are still bored, start rummaging through Marge's uh, clothes to find something. And all they, they end up finding a box of wigs. Uh, and they or Milhouse suggests they dress up like ladies. Well, first of all, where did this box of wigs come from? Like, why did the, Marge and Homer must be into I've some? I've literally never seen Marge play. wear a wig ever. It, it's all role play. It has to be. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Uh, didn't they go to that wig uh, factory whenever they went to see the old? Uh, World's Fair, though maybe they're just that was Bart. That. that was Bart and Milhouse and Martin and Nelson. Well, it leads to a very 1990s line. Bart asking, "Wouldn't that make us kind of fruity?" And then Milhouse says, "What are you, a coward or a scaredy cat?" I, don't I like know. that Milhouse is like egging his friend on, and he's like even doing to the point of like, yeah, it's like almost like I double dare you, or like, "What are you? You're too scared to dress like a girl, you sissy." That's, yeah. <laughs> 
yeah, it's kind of just it's it's again it's a weird joke because of the uh, it being twenty two years old, but uh, that that's the idea of the joke behind it. Yeah, it hasn't necessarily aged well, but like it's especially the lines that Homer has in a little while. It's not supposed to make Homer flattering. No, not at all. Uh, and that's when Homer actually bursts through to see that uh, his son and son's friend dress like ladies, uh, and he actually falls off the bed, Bart does specifically, and lands on a bowling ball. Oh. Homer, it looks painful. Homer comes in, like, threatening, what's going on? And I want a non-gay explanation. Uh, we're drunk. Really drunk. And Homer responds, oh, thank God, which Bart's literally groaning in pain with a broken ass, as we'll find out in a minute. But yeah, <laughs> definitely a, a silly concept. Oh, how dumb we were 22 years ago. Uh, but I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm going through this a lot watching Survivor. I've been rewatching that. And like, it's just a different world in the 90s, man. It's crazy to think about like, just how different it is. We talk about it on a lot, so I don't want to go too into it. But these types of jokes, like the idea that Homer thinks it's uh, better for his 10 year old son to be drunk than to be gay uh, is just it doesn't doesn't really read well in, in 2021. And uh, I don't think to the show's credit that they would make this joke in 2021. Well, I honestly think, too, they were already past that at this point. I think they were just trying to paint Homer as like completely out of touch with society. And like I, I after they did the episode, uh, the other Christmas episode, I get, well, no, that's just that Santa Claus in it. The one where he makes a gay friend and John. Like I, I think they're already past that point. I think this is just they're being trying uh, to be overly I ridiculous. Know, I think it's still very much part of the culture to use gay as a derogatory term. Well, I just think they were trying to make it over the top with Homer in this moment because they had already they already know that it's like past the point of it being I bad. guess time will tell. We'll be we'll be reviewing some more episodes on the uh you know topic in the future and we'll see if these things come up. Yep. Uh, but for now, uh, they do need to get Bart some medical attention because, again, he straight up broke his ass. As we found out. <laughs> uh, what is it? Do Dr. Hibbert is, like, using the defibrillator on uh, Bart's ass, basically. Why are you doing that? Oh, it's good for the batteries. No, I'm afraid your son has uh, cracked his cockix. <laughs> Sorry. How long will it take to recover? Uh, Hibbert explains that he's going to have to wear a fanny cast for quite some time, and he puts on this like really awkward butt cast. Uh, and he basically is like trying to reassure Bart that it won't be that bad, but it's clearly super bad. Uh, and Bart's like even more upset because like, do all of these people have to watch me? And we pan out to see there's a window with several medical students taking notes on Bart's butt. Now, son, this is a teaching hospital, which is why I equipped the seat of your cast with a viewing window. <laughs> you can see there's like just a square cut out of Bart's cast so you can clearly see his butt more clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Such a silly joke. Uh, apparently in the initial idea for the script, it was going to be Millhouse who broke his ass, but they decided that Bart would fit the narrative and push the story a little bit quicker. Uh, and I think that's accurate. It's We pick on Millhouse all the time. But... What ends up Bart happening D. is Bart has to be in a wheelchair and he can't make it into school because there are no ramps. There's no accessibility, uh, which is probably not good in 1999. Uh, Bart is just like wheeling into the stairs over and over again. And Skinner like at first scolds him, but Lisa actually is the one to point out, Principal Skinner, I thought public schools were required to have access ramps for the disabled. Technically, yes, but the building costs would be astronomical. And uh, out of nowhere, Fat Tony appears. Uh, he comes out of a tr from behind a tree, and he's like, "Did I hear? <laughs> I don't know. I just went super behind <laughs> <a> tree. <laughs> I was trying to go like monster, and it just came out leggy. I don't know why. <laughs> I say, I say. Now I'm in my head about it too. It's gonna. It might be. A, it might be a country ass monster tonight, folks. I don't even know. But Fat Tony. Uh, is I like the word like now you got did I hear the word astronomical? <laughs> if so, my construction <laughs> outfit, Valdezzo Brothers Olive Oil, is poised to help. No, 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 no. We're not building anything. How can you say that when construction has already begun? 
I'm fucking my voice up so bad. And I don't a, know why. It's fine. <laughs> and all these construction vehicles have like pulled up behind them. All these workers get out and they start building and constructing stuff. And it was like instantaneous. He even had like somebody pull up with a ribbon that said uh, groundbreaking ceremony and put a gold shovel in Skinner's hand as they snapped a picture. And I mean, it all happened like that. They're ready to go. Must be the best material money can buy. And these are not just like some simple ramps. They, it looks like they built a water park throughout the school. Mm -hmm. But uh, it happens really fast, too. And uh, Skinner is like, good Lord, do we really need all of these ramps? Who's to say? Does a peacock need all those feathers? Look, you're getting a little philosophical for me. I suppose so. They say it happens in the autumn years. Well, be that as it may. Get your hand off my car. Yeah, Skinner's like leaning up against Fat Tony's car. He's not he's not taking it. Uh, it gets to the grand opening of the school with its new and improved uh, accessibility ramps. And Skinner is super proud uh, to announce that they are finally compliant. Or I'm sorry, as of today, <laughs> they are compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1975. No, 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 it, no, 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 no. They're closer than ever to be. Yes, they, yeah. <laughs> man, Fat Tony's voice has just wrecked your brain, son. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> They're closer than ever before. Yay! Uh, and he introduces to inaugurate the ramp system the first of what he hopes will be many disabled students, <laughs> Bart Simpson. <laughs> That's a bad one. Bart actually disappoints Skinner in a new way by showing up not in a wheelchair. What the? Bart, where's your wheelchair? Don't need it anymore. Doctor says my butt bone's stronger than ever. And we see Bart is literally just bouncing off of his butt on the sidewalk and being like, ta-da. I mean, that like looks like it would hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. Well, at least we're prepared for the new millennium. And he actually just gives the ramp a nice little love pat, which causes the entire thing to crumble to the ground. <laughs> My God, the whole thing's made of breadsticks. And we see the seagulls come down eating the remains of the ramps. Uh, and Fat Tony adds, and paint and shellac. It's all itemized in this bill. 200 Gs. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> $200,000? Like, Are you mad? <laughs> but Fat Tony doesn't get mad. He gets stabby. I don't get mad. I get stabby. So <laughs> we we see Skinner is now addressing uh, all of the staff and students, and he says, good news, we no longer need to fear the vicious mob reprisal, uh, as we see Fat Tony drive away with a sack of cash. But then Skinner hangs a close sign on the door and says, but due to lack of funds, Springfield Elementary is closed forever. Yay! Yay! Oh, you're cheering now, but someday. Yay! Yay! I'm just going to stop trying. Yay! Yay! And that brings us to the end of our first act, which I will point out, I think we took like six times as long to get through that as they did, because that act was short <laughs> as fuck. It was only four minutes and 43 seconds long. We'll assume the amount of time they recorded dialogue probably lasted almost as long as we did. You would hope. Yeah, you would <laughs> hope. Uh, but we open up with a Springfieldians meeting at Principal Skinner's house trying to discuss what they can do because they clearly can't just close a school. I mean, what will become of our kids? Where are the refreshments? <laughs> That's what Homer's concerned about. Uh, but Skinner points out, you keep asking that, me that, and I keep telling you over there where there's a clear table even marked refreshments with like cookies and stuff on it. No, they've got two cooks actually preparing food. Like, I, it's completely noticeable, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> well, but I mean, like the school is broke, but they got like this fancy luncheon going on over there. Mm -hmm. You wonder how many textbooks I could buy mm -hmm, with ads in them. Uh, they're trying to raise the two hundred thousand dollars they need. Uh, Ned is very Ned-like and immediately offers his motorhome to raffle off because I mean he did buy one in season one, and we never see him use it. Maybe you should shut up. <laughs> well, oh, okay. And that I, sits I down. Of, I thought of that because Homer used it in Lemon of Troy. He took That's his true. Little so, like, it's Homer gets great use out of that. That's why he said that. Mm -hmm. He gets all that stuff. He didn't want other people using it. 
Uh, I also like Mo's suggestion of selling liquor. After all, I, he does that, and he says, I'm doing great. Please, sir, put some, put some shoes on. What? You don't like my bags? And he's wearing literally bread bags for shoes. Oh, people, these are all good ideas. No, they're not. They're terrible ideas. You're right. It's hopeless. No one has that kind of money. Uh, what about Mr. Burns? Maybe he'll help us out. Oh, forget mm -hmm. it. He releases the hounds on every charity that comes to his door. Feed the children, save the whales, even release the hounds. <laughs> but Skinner decides that maybe they can pry open his wallet with a professional pitch. A school play! Uh, so they put together a play at Skinner, or I'm sorry, at Burns' mansion, which is a weird venue for a school play. It's, I know. You just feel like the echoiness in that whole place, I feel like, even though it's just a brief scene. And even like, though it, like, literally moves Mr. Burns, like, he's able to have an emotional connection, which you wouldn't think he would. Well, they're clever about it. And they title their play, The Nice Man Giveth. <laughs> uh, we start with Nelson as a chef mixing soup in a bowl, but he has two cans, and he doesn't know which to use. There's one salt and one rat poison. And Nelson's like, hmm, which one of these is the salt? Too bad I'm an idiot, because my school closed. Oh, well. And he starts to pour in the rat poison. No, that's the rat poison. Skinner freezes the frame. Now who in Springfield will eat the poison broth? Oh, ho, ho. it could be anyone. Even Mr. Burns. This play really speaks to me. <laughs> I love that line. I, <laughs> they're like literally <laughs> writing it to him, so yeah. the connection is amazing. So uh, we see make... next... Uh, Bart shows up as an ambulance driver with a puppet of Mr. Burns or like a dummy in the back. And Bart declares, I can't take Mr. Burns to the hospital because I'm too dumb to read a map. Oh, why did my school have to close? Hmm. Bart starts to take Mr. Burns to the hospital where he finds Ralph the doctor. And we put Burns on the examination table and get, again, one of the, I think, the underrated uh, Ralph lines. Hello, I'm Dr. Stupid. I'm going to take out your liver bones. And he chops Mr. Burns' head off. Oops, you're dead. <laughs> I never liked that Dr. Stupid. <laughs> Who he met 30, not even 30, 12 seconds ago. <laughs> I just love that response. <laughs> this is when it gets a little bit preachy because Milhouse, Lisa, and Martin come out holding a sign saying, Save our school. Principal Skinner reveals that they were seeking charity all along. To which Mr. Burns responds sentimentally, doing something he loves to do for charity, pushing the button that sends them through a trap door. Except this we trap door makes them all fall through the through the uh, floor, and then you pan back out, and they're falling through the ceiling back in the same room they just fell through the floor from. It's the trippiest thing you will ever see, and I absolutely love it. I guarantee you it's not the trippiest thing I've ever seen, but it is a great absurd joke, and I do love Mr. Burns' line right afterwards. Was it, oh, it's doing that thing again. <laughs> yeah, like, this is just like a common, like, hiccup in the system that happens. It's a glitch <laughs> in the Matrix we're all living in. <laughs> but it's just, it's like, when you can, when you see it, it just happens real quick, and you're like, oh, what? Oh, okay, that's funny. So... <laughs> We see that the children of Springfield, including Bart and Lisa, have turned to the television for education. Uh, Bart and Lisa are watching television in Spanish, Donde Esta Justice. Uh, we get like a court scene with a plaintiff and a judge. Uh, I honestly have no idea what's happening on here. Scott came with Indoors and Limon. I just know uh, with yeah, Bart just has an opinion. With a lemon. Oh, nice. I like Bart's reaction, though. Oh, daytime TV is muy estupido. <laughs> uh, he does turn the channel to once again find Kent Brockman reporting on the Springfield Elementary School, which has now saying it's reopening its doors. <gasps> and we find Kent interviewing Jim Hope of Kid First Industries, KFI, which has generously stepped in to educate the children of Springfield. And this is where we meet uh, our character, Jim Hope, who is voiced by Tim Robbins. That's, I knew I recognized his voice, and I, I didn't catch it in the end. That's right, Kent. You know, when public schools drop the ball, it's up to the private sector to fall on that fumble and run for the end zone. 
Will you be replacing the current teachers and administrators? Very much so, Kent. <laughs> but they're already received an extremely generous severance package. And we see Skinner in his house holding a basket of oranges. Valencia? Ugh, these are juice oranges. <laughs> He's not happy. That's not a very lucrative uh, parting package there. <laughs> uh, but the children of Springfield are forced to return to school. Uh, and it's actually Jim is teaching the class. Howdy, children. I'd like to welcome you back to school. Boo! You know what? I agree. <gasps> Your old school was boring. That's why it failed, right? Well, we're not going to make you memorize facts and dates. No, no, no. I'm going to find out what you really love in life and teach to that. And Bart is actually pointed to his le and, and asked what he's passionate about. And Bart tries to do his class clown bit by saying, boogers. <laughs> <laughs> boogers. <laughs> that was great. You know, humor is a sign of intelligence. Wait, you're not mad? Hey, I'm here to make sure that you get a kick out of education. And he actually yeah. kicks a textbook like karate style. It was like a roundhouse kick on that thing. Yay! And Nelson's like, he rekindled my love affair with books. I swear, I looked at the credits and I just did not see Tim Robinson's name pop up, but I might have been hurrying to get on to do our show. But I was it was killing me that I couldn't pick out his voice for the longest time. Yeah, uh, I thought it was really funny, especially with this kind of corporate character and who Tim Robbins is as a person. Like, they're very much he would be opposed to this type of uh, corporation. So, but he does a great job as the character. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Uh, so we see Bart's back at home destroying books by kicking and punching them. Uh, and he's like, very proud because he's already kicking books at a sixth grade level. Get them, boy. Hit those smart ass books. Marge is like asking Lisa why she's not doing it too. And Lisa has to explain that Bart already broke them all. Uh, and Bart is like actually more excited about school than Lisa for the first time. Cause he's even proud. He's like, you know what our homework is? We just have to find a toy and bring it to class. Boy, that sounds fun. I know, but I'm still not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> And when we get back to the elementary school, this is the first time I believe that it's referenced at all that it's Christmas because we see yeah. that it's decorated for Christmas and it just suddenly becomes uh, a Christmas episode. And Jim even declares like in this opening sentence here, since Christmas is coming soon, I thought we'd talk about our favorite toys. Uh, and he starts pulling the room essentially to do kind of a show and tell. And it's very weird. You know, something is up. Even if you've never mm -hmm. seen this episode before, you know, there's something odd about what's happening. Millhouse is going through and, and talking about his busy box, which uh, I do like it. Like he's kind of roasted a bit because he's like, Oh, good for you. Not paying attention to the recommended age limit. <laughs> what are you talking about? And he reads ages two to four. Oh, geez. But he goes yeah, around the rest. I'm calling daddy too, which doesn't. Oh help. yeah, yeah, I'm calling daddy. <laughs> uh, they go around and he's like asking them what they like about their their toys, things like they're special and they're challenging. Which I love, Nelson. Uh, he's when he says they're challenging, he's struggling with Jack in the Box because he's turning it backwards, <laughs> and the song is playing backwards, which yeah. is the really funny part. Very good. Now I want you all to imagine the perfect toy. What would it be like? And they get an, a range, like a, a far like range of, of answers here because they get everything from soft and cuddly to lots of fire power, lots of telescopes, no periscopes, no microscopes. Uh, and then, can you come back to me? It should be full of surprises. It should never stop dancing. It should need accessories. Uh, and this is where we finally reveal that on the other side of the chalkboard, there's actually an office. They've converted the school into a, or the chalkboard into a one-way mirror so that they can actually spy <laughs> on the class. And we see Lindsay Nagel return, uh, and another character, Phil, as they're taking notes on this market research. Uh, and I like Lindsay Nagel's line, now that's market <laughs> research you can take to the bank. The money bank. <laughs> I just wish those second graders would stop jerking us around. And they switch to a different class, taught by Miss Hoover, uh, where Ralph is saying things like, fun toys are fun. Well said, Ralph, but we're trying to come up with a name for a toy. 
Mrs. Fun, not bad. Fun. Ralph, there are no right or wrong answers, but if you don't pipe down, I'm giving you an F. The before teacher yelled at me, too. No one's yelling. We're just brainstorming names. Lisa, any ideas? And Lisa's clearly distracted by something. She puts her book down, and she like is kind of trying to figure out what's happening. Like, oh, a, a name with fun? Uh, fungus, fungos, Attila the fun. Lisa, are you doing math? Uh, just a few Venn diagrams. There's more under the table. <laughs> I like uh, so all of Lisa's names. Lisa, Lisa is uh, in trouble, and it's basically a role reversal situation where, under this new corporatized school system, Bart is excelling like never before, and Lisa is actually put into detention, where we see her writing on the uh, chalkboard, much like her brother usually does. Only this time, she's writing, "I will not do math in class." Uh, after five o'clock for what it's worth too when this is happening. Yeah, I was gonna make the same comment. It was like five twenty. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. Uh Bart shows up to kind of make fun of her, and he's doing so with a lot of funny missteps with his wording, like things like, uh, huh, the ironing is delicious. The word is irony. Huh? <laughs> Don't you think there's something weird going on here? We spent all day selecting fabric swatches, and then our guest speaker was Phil from marketing. All I know is I'm getting straight A's, and that ain't not bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Bart actually like flicks the lights out on his sister as uh, he's leaving the classroom just to kind of mock her a bit. And it actually reveals that there is a tiny sliver of light coming from the chalkboard. And this uh, actually is how they reveal to Lisa that they are being spied on this entire time. And there's actually a creepy moment where she walks in and she hears from the darkness a weird robot voice say, I see you. And then there's this creepy robot, all parts, walking behind her with creepy eyes. But also asking for a hug. And it's basically the skeleton, the robo-skeleton of the Funzo, which is very similar to a Furby. We don't know that yet. We just see that this is the first time we're seeing anything. Oh, yeah. It's when we open up in a minute that we actually... Man, Miles had to give that away. Oh, oh yeah. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> but that brings us to the end of our second act. Uh, and this one was slightly more balanced. It's still a little on the short end because this episode's less than 21 minutes total. And that act was 6 minutes, 20 seconds. So basically the first 11 minutes make up the first two acts and then the last 10 uh, mm -hmm. make up the third acts. Because they're about to rush them. We haven't actually been introduced to Funzo yet and we're through the second act. Yeah. So definitely an off-balance episode, but still, again, it's not the episode that I was expecting at this point, but it's still a good episode. It's still very entertaining. Uh, yeah. That's a sneak peek. <laughs> uh, we cut to later that night when, and this is opening our third act, Lisa is showing her parents and they've dragged Chief Wiggum out of bed, uh, who is uh, already like complaining, like, this better be important, Lisa. I left Ralphie alone in the bathtub. <laughs> Daddy, I'm ready to get out now. Over. <laughs> <laughs> he just ignores it. Uh Lisa's taking them to the broom closet at the school where she's about to show them the secret surveillance room guarded by a tiny evil robot. And this is a great joke. Probably oh my, my favorite God. joke in the episode because Homer <laughs> interrupts his daughter to say, Ugh, is this going to be like one of those horror movies where we open the door and everything's normal and we think you're crazy, but then there really is a killer robot. And the next morning you find me impaled on a weather vane. Is that what this is, Lisa? To be fair, not all evil robots are killers. <laughs> March's response is so grounded there. <laughs> Listen, when you see what's inside, and she opens the door to have a mop fall out, land on her head, and of course, it's exactly like Homer said it would be, nothing is there. And Lisa is killed by a weather vane. Oh, wait. Yeah. I could swear it was right there. <laughs> yeah, well, mop top, and I'm Ed Sullivan. <clears throat> Really big shoot. No, no, I can do it better. <clears throat> really big show. I mean, big normal. That's so it. that's Wiggum. So that that's Wiggum doing an impression of Ed Sullivan, which is just voice acting talent on a level that we're not even gonna fuck with. No, no, that's I, I don't even know what Ed Sullivan sounds like anymore. Yeah, hundred percent. 
Uh, we do know what Krusty the Clown sounds like, oh. and we cut to Lisa and Bart watching his show. <clears throat> well, folks, that's the end of Krusty's non-denominational holiday fun fest. I want to thank my guest, Tia Leone, Beck, the Dixie Chicks. <laughs> Merry Christmas, y'all. And Patrick Ewing as the genie. I think they didn't say anything, but I swear I think that's a joke about uh, Shaq being Kazam. No, Patrick Ewing's a real basketballer, though. No, I understand that, but I think that they just kind of did like the Patrick Ewing as a basketball player playing a genie. I think they were making fun oh. of the movie Shazam that came out with a basketball player uh, playing yeah, a genie. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were talking about the basketball trick he did because he was spinning a basketball on his finger, but he pulls his finger away and the basketball does not move mm -hmm. and it's spinning in the air. And I don't know why I just love that movie. That, so that. funny. So have a Merry Christmas. Ha Happy Hanukkah. Quasi Kwanzaa. A tip top tip. And a solemn, dignified Ramadan. Now a word from my God, our sponsor. <laughs> and we see it's actually Krusty's commercial. is a little girl walking down a stairway on Christmas morning. And she hears a little voice say, I see you. Huh? She picks up a little furry doll and gives it a hug. And Lisa immediately recognizes it as a furry version of the robot that attacked her. I got to tell you this, though. They were just developing this toy like a day ago, and they've already got a freaking ad for it. Money like, happens fast, man. No, capitalism, no. You, capitalism is a, a full speed ahead freight train, sir. You're, you're building this toy like where we're at now in the real world in, in April, almost May, for it to come out on Christmas. That's it. Man, cartoon time works crazy, man. Super well, crazy. Also, trapdoors fall through the floor and then release into the same room. So, you know. Super crazy, man. But for right now, we have a Christmas commercial. This Christmas, everybody wants Funzo. Funzo? I said that name in class. Funzo's soft and cuddly. With lots of firepower. And we even hear like Funzo in Nelson's voice say, Ha ha! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I've ever caught that before, but on this playthrough, I wrote that note down. <laughs> I, I don't know why I didn't catch that before. No, Funzo! 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 If you don't have a Funzo, you're nothing. <laughs> That's a, pretty much how marketing is done. Uh, yep. Nelson's line thing did remind me, when Lisa's in the uh, room, like when she first discovers they're being spied on, she picks up a clipboard and all the phrases that are on it are things like soft and cuddly, lots of firepower, telescopes, periscopes, my microscopes, surprises, dancing, and then it says, ha ha, and then Attila the fun. <laughs> I just And it's spelled out H-A-W, H-A-W, which I just thought was, uh, wow. was really cool. Uh-huh. Uh, but yeah, that's as direct of marketing as you can possibly get to make kids feel singled out if they don't have the hot new toy. And it works immediately on the genius with the sense of humor because Bart is like, Mom, I know what I want for Christmas. Bart, they lied to us. Instead of giving us an education, they tricked us into designing a toy. Aren't you outraged? No, but if you're going to throw a spaz, I'll come with. Good. Saddle up the bikes. <laughs> So we get a classic pairing of brother and sister, which I, I usually do like these moments when Bart and Lisa pair up to fight a bigger evil. Uh, I think these like feel a lot like the comic book stories in a lot of way, which are super fun. Uh, they actually go and sneak into KFI into the secret headquarters where they come across a security guard. Uh, but Bart recognizes the guard as Gary Coleman, another celebrity on this long list of celebrity guests on this episode. But the menu said galaxy of bronze. Three prawns are hardly a galaxy. What do you mean your hands are tied? Let me talk to Mr. Kwan. <laughs> so they are able to like crawl by unnoticed. Uh, but Bart wants to see how it turns out. So uh, Lisa actually has to point out that the phone that Gary Coleman is talking on isn't even plugged in. All right. You listen to me, Kwan. Hang on. I got another call. Click. Yes, Mr. President, I can be in Washington right away. <laughs> so uh, Gary Coleman's off his rocker. Uh, I think I did a pretty <laughs> damn good Gary Coleman, too. There. That was not bad. Uh, <laughs> in an office, we see them looking over the Funzo production line, and there is none other than their teacher, Jim Hope, and Lindsay Nagel. Uh-oh. You people took advantage of trusting school children. 
How did you get past Gary Coleman? <laughs> Let's just say he's a few prawns short of a galaxy. <laughs> Uh, we see Gary oh, yeah. Coleman come doing karate moves beside the desk as they come in. I'm sorry, Gary. There's no longer a place for you here. What you talking about, Miss Nagel? That is so adorable. You're rehired. Sucker. I knew exactly what she was talking about. <laughs> and he goes back to sleep. Mm, uh, perfect so job. They did talk about it a lot. Uh, they talked about working with Gary Coleman a lot more than anybody else in the commentary, uh, specifically because he was actually fairly sensitive. Not sensitive. He was resistant to doing a lot of jokes with the what you talking about, Willis. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's going to come back into play later at the end of, of the episode. We're going to talk more about it. That's called a tease, ladies and gentlemen. For now, though, Bart is teasing himself by looking at all the what? Funzo accessories. He's uh, sees the Dream Force Fortress and the lower back pain chair and the European voltage converter. Well, this is after they leave the uh, the KFI or place. That, like, oh I, yeah, I, we should have specified that you are you are correct. The yeah, they, Nagel and Jim Hope. Talk to Lisa saying it's designed by children for children with all the profits going to children. And Lisa's like, really? And they said, I mean, we're all someone's children. <laughs> but they do get a free funzo, which Bart immediately yeah. is like, yep, that works. Yep. And that's when we see him going through the accessory book. He wants the funzo dream forgers, the funzo lower back chain chair, the funzo European voltage conversion converter. Yeah. It's and all funzo. <laughs> yeah. Funzo is marketing to him directly. Three it is. <laughs> uh, he uses Funzo's control. ears as a sharpener too. Yeah. Thanks, Funzo. You rock. <laughs> uh, even Lisa has to admit. Oh, it's kind of All right, I just want everyone out there to know that Bart's appropriate. Or I mean, excuse me, you're not Bart. You're Miles. Miles's appropriate response to "Thanks, Funzo, you rock" was "All righty." And then Miles is supposed to dance on camera, or you know, describe his dancing to the listeners out there, and he just went right over that topic. So I, I tried, guys. I tried to get my house. It's, it's in the Patreon version of the show. Miles <laughs> <laughs> does the Funzo dance, which is just um, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Give me, give me enough money, and I'll do that. Whatever. Uh, for, for now, though, we're gonna go ahead and move on and talk about it. Always being a party with Funzo, and Lisa even having to admit that it is kind of cute, uh, but it'll never take the place of Malibu Stacy. Uh oh. Uh, but it literally does because it snaps Malibu Stacy's neck and throws its body into the fireplace. Did you see that? Yeah, Funzo makes playtime fun. But that's when Funzo actually starts strangling Krusty, the Krusty doll, with its like own pull string. And like the, the thing that's so weird is the Krusty doll responds to what Funzo is doing. It's, yeah. not, like it's, it's not like it's doing a random vibe. It's like, ah, ah, like it's well, you get a string pulled. It half makes sense. Maybe it's the uh, the doll from the Halloween episode. Yeah, there you go. It just needs to be switched back to good. Well, I've uh, but so they're shocked because they realize that they literally programmed the Funzo to do eliminate the competition by destroying other uh, by destroying other toys. Uh, but when Lisa's like, they reprogram it to eliminate the competition. You mean like Microsoft? Exactly. Come on, Bart. <laughs> We've got to warn everyone. Uh, we see Funzo is like dancing with the decapitated heads of Stacy and Krusty yeah, Mortal Kombat style. He finished them. Flawless victory. Uh, Krusty and even had like a morbid expression on his face too, which furthers my... so point. happy. It makes it worse. Uh, they run to the Bart and Lisa run to the try and save, which we've seen in a previous Christmas episode, which is another thing that makes this a Christmas episode, which is kind of funny. Uh, mm -hmm. But Lisa and Bart arrive on their bikes trying to boycott Funzo because he's a toy killing machine. Uh, but immediately, like, we can see that this is a classic Springfield mob situation because there is already a large crowd of people waiting outside of the store for the display to open or for the store to open so they can buy a Funzo. And even the Funzo in the display window, like, instigates a riot when basically, I think it's Mo, uh, is like, oh, I can't wait. Uh, no, Lenny's like, hey, I'm not waiting till the store opens. And he smashes the uh, the giant I, I, window. I why? I love that moment with Lenny. Yeah, it's really <laughs> funny. Lenny and Carl are both there to get a toy. They don't have children. No, they just want one for themselves, collective exactly. style. <laughs> 
Uh, we actually see there is an absurd number of surveillance cameras in this try and save, probably because of Bart's previous esca escapades. But uh, we see all sorts of angles covering covering the store, and it's actually Jim Hope and Lindsay Nagel are watching them from a hot tub, uh, and they're trying to like basically use the scale of the uh, the scale of the riot to like calculate how much profit they'll make. And Lindsay's like, hmm, they use time elapsed muttering from, or the time elapsed from muttering to the door smash calculates to a profit of 370 million. Uh, I'd like to see some trampling. That'd be the icing on the cake. And then immediately we see Mo being trampled. <laughs> and then cling with the wine glasses or whatever it is. Lisa is ready to admit defeat to kids first, but Bart, actually, the boy genius with a sense of humor, uh, comes up with a pretty decent plan. It makes as much sense as a fat man in a red suit being able to deliver presents all over the world in one night. Uh, on Christmas Eve at 6 o'clock, they get Homer to dress up like Santa, and they drive around. Bart and Lisa distract the homeowner while Homer sneaks in and actually steals the funzo. Uh, I love when they're pitching this plan to Homer because they don't really actually explain it too much. They just kind of like go by. And, yeah, they're already on the way, and Homer's like, "So who am I beating up?" Nobody. You're just gonna break into everyone's house and steal their favorite toy, thus saving Christmas. Now let's see. This will make three Christmases I saved versus eight I ruined. Two were kind of a draw. Dad, Dad, you're driving on the sidewalk. Oops, sorry. Mm. Almost a ninth Christmas ruin. That, uh, means, that makes, that makes uh, by my calculations, wait, 8 and 3 is 11 plus 2 is 13. Is that how many he said? So we're only on season 11, so we got a few stories in there that we've missed. Yeah, so maybe it's counting like times where he celebrated like the Christmas at like Ned's and then also at home. Uh, well, I think there were Christmas before the children, but also one of the draw Christmases is the one where Bart ruined the tree, I think. That was mm -hmm. one of the draw, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, that's not his fault, really. Exactly. Uh, we see they visit the Wiggums, where Bart and Lisa sing Joy to the World, while Homer very clumsily removes the Funzo from under the, uh, under the tree. Uh, and like as soon as he does do, they just like stop singing mid-song and run to the next house, which is the Hibberts. This time they choose Silent Night, which is not a loud enough song <laughs> to cover the disaster that Homer is dealing with, like knocking over everything, including the tree itself, uh, mm -hmm. and a dog who starts biting him. Should have given him a funzo to chew on. They do start like singing louder though to try yep. to cover it up. Uh, but we very Fire. quickly cut to the Simpsons arriving at the Springfield Tire Fire with an entire sack of funzos who are activated and like you know, like barreling around in the bag. And uh, writhing funzos in my sack makes me happy, makes me hurt my back. Jump, dump them in the fire, Dad. Yes, the madness ends here. Ha! If I had a nickel for every time I've heard that. But <laughs> Homer actually swings the bag of robot dolls around and throws them into the base of the fire. The funzos are burned up, uh, but then they come out of the sack like T2 style, yeah. annoyed. Uh, we see the Kids First Industry Jeep show up in the nick of time, and Gary Coleman jumps out. Well, what do we have here? And he pulls out his nightstick. Looks like the biggest ripoff since Webster. Please, Mr. Coleman, we can explain. I'm listening. Your toy company is evil. Well, isn't it possible for an evil company to make people happy? Are you saying the end justifies the means? That's a very glib interpretation. <laughs> hey, don't talk to my sister that way. No, no, Bart, Bart, he's right. I did oversimplify. <laughs> <laughs> then Homer jumps in. Perhaps. But let's not get bogged down in semantics. I think what Lisa meant to say is... And we have a narrator out of nowhere jump in, like <laughs> Christmas like classic style. And so Gary Coleman and the Simpsons argued long into the night. And then as the day broke, the spirit of the season entered their hearts. Let's just agree that the commercialization of Christmas is, at best, a mixed blessing. Amen. <laughs> but then we see a bear robot, uh, like the fiery Funzo, emerging from the fire, and uh, Gary Coleman beats the crap out of it. <laughs> well, there's something you don't see every Christmas. 
And that's basically like, again, like the only way you really know it's a Christmas episode is because they kind of like force it upon it at the end a little bit. <laughs> and that's when Homer's like, oh crap, we got to get home. Uh, and they actually see Gary Coleman's like standing by himself, but Bart uh, talks to Homer. And they walk over to Gary Coleman. Um, uh, Mr. Coleman, I've been thinking, uh, my wife always makes too much stuffing and sweet potatoes and all, and, uh, oh, heck, would you like to spend Christmas with us? <laughs> no way, I'm having Christmas at George Clooney's house. And he, like, straightens his tie and combs his hair. And Lisa goes, Gary. All right, I'll come. So this is where it just goes off the handle because honestly, they're just like wrapping every loose end together all in like yeah, 12 seconds. Yeah. Burns and Smithers come in and join the Simpsons and Gary Coleman in the Simpsons dining room. We get the narrator back and Gary Coleman was as good as his word. And as for <laughs> old Mr. Burns, he was visited by three ghosts during the night and agreed to fund the school with some money he found in his tuxedo pants. And it's like a massive, huge wad of cash. And also, wouldn't he be giving it to the school and not the Simpsons directly? Yeah, he just hands it to them, yeah. assuming it'll go to the right place. <laughs> Which it won't. Thank you. Thank you. Humbug. <laughs> While Mo, seeing what the world would be like if he had never been born, pulled his head out of the oven and replaced it with a plump Christmas goose. Which may be the darkest joke, even, I mean, this is going back to Merkin moments, like hardcore. This is swinging Homer silhouette, changing the light bulb joke. This because is a pretty dark it, joke, yeah. There is a sign on Moe's back as he's leaned into the oven that says, no funeral. <laughs> and he, I guess, has a change of heart and cooks a duck and shows up at this very weird variety Christmas. You know, Miles, like, I don't know if we've, we talked about touching base on it when it happened. Is this the turning point where Mo becomes like this depressive of a character? It, it's definitely something I think we should be on the lookout for. Like we've talked about, there's a moment where he goes from just being the way Mo was earlier to where he becomes like, like almost a scoundrel and like definitely yeah. like involved in some nefarious things, but not necessarily suicidal. Yeah. Like this might be the turning point. They might've thought, well, this was kind of funny in a really messed up way. And that's where they just like, Went off the handle, starting right here. But they do take a hard veer, and again, Mo makes the duck, and he shows up. Yeah, happy holidays there. Merry Christmas, Mo. Uh, listen, I uh, kind of banged up that Jeep in the uh, driveway. What you talking about, Mo? And then everyone has a laugh, and Gary Coleman, who has his back to us, turns into the fourth wall and has the closing line of the show. What you talking about, everyone? Which and I the, everyone the laughs to get. What you talking about, I say everyone? It all the time because of this episode. So I mentioned earlier from the commentary, they talked about Gary Coleman uh, was very adamant when, like, they're like, "I don't want to be like a parody. Like, don't make me do the shit too much. Like, you know, like be cool." Uh, but they actually got him to come in for a second day because they broke this joke and liked it so much. And to his credit, while, well, again, he had said up front he gets annoyed by those jokes, he agreed to come in and do this one, even though it had to be shot on a second day. And they said that he was an absolute pleasure uh, and a great sport about it. And they were really, really happy with the way that joke came out. Well, good. It seemed like, just from the outside looking in, it seems like he had a lot of fun during the episode. It does seem that way. I, I definitely agree. But. That brings us to the end of Grift of the Magi. Richie, is there anything else about uh, this episode that you'd like to say before we get out of here? Yeah, it's not one of my favorite Christmas episodes because, quite, quite frankly, you don't know it's a Christmas episode. Like it, it's, I feel that. It, it won't be on my list of that. It definitely it won't even be on my list of like top episodes of the season or anything like that. But like it it's just a weird feeling episode to me, man. Like it's just like we talked about at the beginning, it takes too long to get into the funzo stuff. And I, I think I just confused this episode with like the itchy and scratchy one where they come up with Poochie where like they have the dials and they're saying, well, what do you want out of this? And they're like, well, I want them to go on this adventure and this adventure and this adventure. And like, I think I just have meshed those two scenes together. And I think they're both the same episode. That's the only explanation I can come no, up that, that makes a lot of sense, honestly. I get that. But it's got a lot of funny moments. We're starting to see 
Homer take a little bit more of a backseat in some episodes, but they're still finding ways to give him clever little moments. Like he didn't have a lot of dialogue in this, but everything he did was pretty damn funny in this one. So I agree with that as well. It's still a funny episode. I just it just felt a little off to me for some reason. I will definitely. So I think if I were just going by memory, I might have even included this in like my top five Christmas episodes. Just like trying to think back and remember Christmas episodes without having seen them all. Uh, but as we go through this podcast and like, we're actually getting a fresh take on them. Yeah. This barely qualifies as a Christmas episode. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there is one other big thing I want to talk about. I think it's kind of cool. Uh, I mentioned earlier at the top of the show that this episode released, I believe it was December 19th, 1999. And this episode is very special because it is the final episode of not only the decade, not only the century, but also the millennium. So it holds the title for for all three. Uh, And I'm like, I know that it's just a year and it doesn't really matter that you go from 93 to 94, 99 to zero, zero. But at the same time, we as a society do look on things as a decade, a lot of times, like in, in decade terms and just in that block. Uh, and I'm, I'm just very curious to see what type of culture shifts that we're going to see hitting into the early aughts, because I mean, we're getting to a point where technology advancements are going to start sky. I mean, just think about like between 2001 and 2004, we went from like eight gigabyte uh, or no, I'm sorry, megabyte. No, whatever the smaller one is MP3 players to the iPhone. Yeah. It, it's going to fly and it's going to get weird. I think. Well, and I definitely think that it, it like you said, it's going to be a lot quicker than we realize once it starts happening too. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with that as well. Uh, but I do believe that's going to do it for this week's Best Darn Diddly Review Show. Uh, as always, love you guys so much for hitting the download button, sharing, talking about us, just having good vibes or thoughts towards our general direction. All of that stuff helps, and, and we appreciate you so much for it. Yeah, and as always, you can follow Miles at Mr. Most Days Off all over social media, uh, especially on his Facebook. And I assume you're doing it on Instagram and everything else, too. He's starting to post his actual stand-ups with subtitles, too. So you guys should definitely check that out. It's really, really funny. My TikTok Um, game is strong, son. Listen to our last episode, and you'll know what his kind of humor is like a little bit. Um, You can follow me at the (laughs) Wiz underscore Kid23. But most importantly, you can follow our show at Best Darn Diddly. That's D-I-D-D-L-Y. For the record, I don't just tell weed jokes. I just released a bunch of clips on 420, so it seemed appropriate. (laughs) Hey, uh, it's all good. Uh, Guys, next week, I'm not sure what we're going to be talking about. Uh, We're going to do a couple of best darn everythings in between now and our next Simpsons episode. But if everything goes according to plan, fingers crossed, good vibes only. If everything goes according to plan, the next time we talk about The Simpsons, we're going to be talking about Little Big Mom, and it's going to be a really awesome time. I uh, I know we're going to have a great guest, and I, I'm very much looking forward to it. So make sure you come back again for that, and make sure you come back again next week for our next Best Darn Everything. Hey, Miles, if you're uh, going to do another episode where you throw a spaz, I'll come with. <laughs> and until next time... Be cromulent to each other.